Aaron Osman, the author of Jason Molina, Riding with the Ghost, which was just published by Roman and Littlefield. Thanks for coming down to WPRB, Aaron. Thank you for having me, John. So you're on tour with Songs Molina, a memorial electric company. Yes. How have the, I know I saw you in Philadelphia last night, how have the show has been going and I guess, explain the, the overall experience of the evening for people who's in the band and, and what they can expect. Yeah, but so far the response has been really incredible. Um, people are just really kind, um, generous, participatory, um, lots of singing in the audiences. It's just been really a joyful celebration of a musician that we all loved so much. Um, so basically the idea for the tour came about... Um, Kind of in the wake of, of Jason's passing, um, his bandmates from the various iterations of Songs Ohio and Magnolia Electric Company kind of joined together to play a memorial for their their friend and their band leader. Um, and um, after that, uh, we started tossing around the idea again when the book came out, um, just as an extension of celebration and a way to pay tribute um, to Jason. Um, and for his songs to keep living in a live setting, which, you know, he loved so much. He was such a, a road dog. And so, you know, really keeping the songs alive. Is it a cathartic experience for all involved? What are the, what are the emotions been like for you these past two shows? I mean, I definitely laughing and crying. Um, certainly cath catharsis. It's been amazing to meet um, Jason's diehard fans, too. I mean, people know so much about him, have great questions, and it's just been really great to interact with the people who are listening to the music and reading the book. And I'd forgotten until we were talking last night that Philadelphia plays a part in Jason's story. That's where the album Didn't It Rain was recorded, and when I was talking to another DJ here, he was telling me that when he used to work at the record store Space Boy on South Street, that used to be a big part of Philadelphia, I guess Jason came in when they were recording and said, oh, you should come by to the session. And, and he only realized after the fact, this guy who does a show here, that uh, Black Link to Fire was the song they were working on when he, uh, when he stopped by. Wow, that's really a neat story. Um, last night in Philadelphia, someone came up and said, I'm so happy that you mentioned Soundgun Studios. Um, he said, you know, I recorded an album there when I was 22, and it's such a distinct and important part of Philly's independent you know, musical history. And, um, he was just really excited that it was mentioned. I know you said it was in an area called the Badlands. Do you know specifically where in Philadelphia it was? I was having difficulty 
triangulating where it might have been. Yeah, so um, Adan, the the engineer, um, described it as being in North Philly in a really industrial um, area that was sort of controlled by a pack of roaming dogs, like feral dogs. Um, so it sounded like it was it was pretty um, a bleak setting at the time, but he was able to get a warehouse and set up an amazing studio. So I'm talking with Aaron Osman, author of Jason Molina, Riding with the Ghost. If people want to pick up a copy of your book, how do you how do you recommend they do so? Yeah. So, I mean, I always say to support your local bookstore. If they, if they have a copy, great. If not, you know, they're always willing to order one. If not, um, the publisher always has them and that's Roman and Littlefield. And that's Roman.com. Mm -hmm. So how did Jason Molina first hit your radar? Yeah. Um, I'm from Indiana, a town called Evansville in Southern Indiana. And when I was about 18, I think, um, this would be 1998, a song of Jason's kind of filtered down to my hometown via a mixtape. It was, uh, I think, someone's older brother who had gone away to school at Indiana University. Um, the song was um, Cowboy Linko, which is also known as Vanquisher, and it's from the Black Album, Jason's first LP, and um, I was immediately mesmerized. It was minimal and poetic. It, it sounded timeless, but it sounded familiar um and it just really struck a chord with me and at the time i was really involved um in diy punk circles listening to a lot of loud rock bands and i hadn't really entertained that type of minimal folk music before as a, as a fan and it really sort of changed my perspective and i was completely hooked on jason after that So Jason Molina passed away in 2013. When did you start working on this book? Almost immediately, um, or I should say I started working on a long form article almost immediately. Um, so when Jason died, I was as shocked and, and saddened as anyone else. And, you know, like many people, I felt compelled to do something. Um, and as a, a writer and a, a researcher and a reporter, um, naturally, I wanted to know the story and to write something about it. Um, but I think one thing that really struck me in the wake of Jason's death was that so many people were talking about it um, and sort of presenting their angle or their hot take or something that, you know, recycling something they had read previously, but no one was talking to the band. I hadn't read any quotes or interviews with the bandmates that Jason had toured with so extensively um, and basically lived in a band with. Um, and so I reached out to Jason Groth, 
of Magnolia Electric Company and just said, hey, is it okay if I talk to you guys about this? Like, um, I'd really love to hear your perspective um, because it's it's not out there yet. And um, we just sort of bonded over conversation and a long form article turned into a book and then the book came out in May. Were people more willing to talk then because his death was so fresh or did some of the folks you spoke with need more time and distance before speaking with you? It, it was a range. Um, you know, some people, you know, not very many, but a couple of people just couldn't bring themselves to talk about it at all, um, which is completely fine. And I don't begrudge them at all. Other people had invested so much time and emotional energy um, into Jason and into help getting helping to get him better um, that I think it was cathartic for them to talk about it and to voice their love for Jason, but also their frustration with the process of trying to get him into rehab. Um, you know, so it was certainly a range of responses, and I was happy to engage with all of them. Was it hard at all to gain people's trust during this process, you know, being entrusted with telling the complete story of his life? Yeah, there were certainly tears. I think, you know, the bandmates are sort of... Um, the front, right, against, again, the, the first entry point, and when I sort of had developed uh, good relationships with them, and they could see that I was serious um, about what I was doing, and that I was going to be respectful, and also holistic, too, that I wasn't going to paint it in some romantic light, or that I wasn't going to be super critical, that my my aim was objectivity, they trusted me, and then um, I was sort of introduced to the family and the label, and things kind of went from there. So they sort of opened the door that allowed you through. Absolutely. There's a fair amount of personal correspondence in the book. Was it difficult to convince the the holders of those photos and letters to include them in this book? Not really. Um, I think again, once I had you know developed the relationship, it was a bit easier, but. Um, Jason was really attached to and committed to this idea of authenticity um, and and the truth. And I think people wanted to respect that. And so if it, it was something that had happened in their relationship with Jason, they felt that he you know, would have, would have wanted um, hol a holistic telling of that. Um, so a lot of people were you know, very open um, with their experiences. Riding with the Ghost is a very linear book. Mm -hmm. It lays out Jason Molina's life from birth to death. But to me, there's a, a serious sense of foreboding that's kind of coming all the way through the book because you know that 2013 is inevitable. Was it hard for you on your end writing a book, you know, knowing that the, the conclusion is set and also that the majority of the people who are going to, to pick up the book already are aware of how the story ends? In a way, that it, it made it easier for me. Um, and I, I certainly wanted to write the book in a way that it would be easy to return to. You know, um, you wouldn't have to do a lot of guesswork about it, where you were when you picked it back up. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the last part of the book is very sad. Um, and of course people who know who Jason is, they, they know how it ends, but, um, one really beautiful and inspiring thing that I found in the sadness of the book was, um, the commitment of Jason's friends and family. It's really beautiful and it's kind of superhuman <laughs> in a way. Jason had this really unique ability to surround himself with really talented and generous people. And I think it's really beautiful how they all came together around him and rallied around him to try to save his life. And so I think there is something really inspiring and beautiful that came out of the ug ugliness of his um, addiction. Yeah, it's a very good, but at times very difficult read because it doesn't really hold anything back as as things work their way towards the, the later stages of his life. But just to be clear, it's not a, a completely bleak and dark read throughout the music that you talk about is is beautiful and poignant, but Jason in real life could be a a light and witty guide. You have a favorite joke or one-liner of his that you might have learned along the way. Oh, 
I mean, there are so many hilarious things about Jason, and that's one great thing about this tour that we're on is hearing people's stories just about the the totally absurd or hilarious um, interactions and encounters and and pranks um, that happened in the van or on tour, and it's it really sheds a new light on on Melina. Um, one thing that just cracks me up, and I I never saw it, but just imagining it um, is when Jason would do this thing that he called songs jazz dance <laughs> and it's when he would break out into spontaneous choreography um and, and silly song in like a high-pitched voice that he called mr squirty <laughs> and this was a, a regular thing that he did um among his friends and just picturing it cracks me up you want to take a break and hear a song sure what would you like to hear oh goodness um how about since we're near Philadelphia, let's listen to Dead in the Rain. That's a great choice. No matter how dark the storm gets overhead They say someone's watching From the calm at the edge What about us when we're down here in it? We gotta walk our own But if you do see that golden light That it shines in its fiery eye Go on and catch it while you it if you can let it course through you and let it burn It's the light of truth. If it's the light of truth. I've 
Seen a good man and a bad man Down the same path Seen the light of truth Keeping Told them to watch their own back. If I see you. Giving all that you got See you work all night Burning your love To the last of its dim ones I'm gonna help you how I See me struggle all night and give me a hand cause I'm in me I'll call you friend in the and I'm gonna walk back. I'm talking with Aaron Osman, author of Jason Molina, Riding with the Ghost. One of my, my favorite quotes from the book is the line where Jason says, I'd explain that our groupies were young men in glasses who asked if Faulkner was our major influence. I thought that was pretty spot on. Yeah, that was actually Jeff Cummings. Um, oh, fair enough. Yeah, one of the, the earliest uh, collaborators of Songs Ohio. He was a the consistent drummer through much of the, the mid to late 90s. Um, he played on um, Impala and a couple other records, Access and Ace. Um, but uh, Jeff is a really, really sharp, intelligent guy and kind of a keen observer of human behavior. But he said that this was certainly a pattern, you know, um, and people were always asking, you know, what is Jason reading? What is what kind of literature or poetry is he into and, you know, the assumptions that came along with that. Are there things that you learned after the book was turned in that you would have wanted to have included had you known about it? Yeah, I was actually saying, um, I think it was last night or the night before, um, 
some of the more hilarious stories that have come out that, you know, people just didn't remember on the spot during an interview. Um, but there was a really funny story that Pete Schreiner from Magnolia Electric Company told about how Jason uh, used to tell his bandmates that his former roommate was a mermaid. And of course, it sounded like an absurd Molina tall tale. And then one night they were playing a kind of a hip club in New York and there was a giant tank filled with water with women swimming in it in mermaid costumes. And after they played, a woman ran up and she had wet hair and she hugged Jason, called him Sparky, which was his nickname from Oberlin. And, uh, and Pete said something like, well, it turns out Jason's roommate was actually kind of a mermaid. I think one of my favorite things that I learned about Jason after he passed away was a list that he and a couple of friends of mine would have of things to say to a band that you saw that your friends were in if you didn't necessarily enjoy them but wanted to pay them something that sounded like a compliment. And so uh, Saw You Up There has stuck with me for a long time. And I know there there's a handful of others on a a handwritten sheet of paper that are, uh, I, I use those even when, when not seeing, but you guys seem like you're having a lot of fun. That's amazing. I love that. I, I love these kind of stories. What was the, the biggest surprise for you while researching the book? Something, and this is a bit tangential, but I just really enjoyed the detail. Um, Eva Watts Russell from 4AD was a fan of the album Impala. Um, he heard one of the songs and actually turned uh, Mark Koslick onto Molina after hearing it. And I had no idea. I don't think anyone had any idea. Um, so that was sort of a neat uh, aside that I learned. I have a lot of regret about this, but you touch upon it in the book. And, and I thought that was interesting. I know when I was living in Chicago in the early 1990s and I first heard Songs Ohio, I very much wrote them off because of the comparison to Will Olam. And I was surprised how much that dogs Jason in the book and how hard he initially took it and how hard he had to work to kind of break free from that classification. Yeah, it, it is unfortunate. I mean, I could see where, you know, there is a surface level comparison to be made, even if I think it's a bit lazy, but Jason, um, he was so he was a poet, you know, and he was kind of a mystic and he was a much better singer than Will Oldham. Fair <laughs> um, enough. And so it, it is unfortunate, but it's, it's something that happened. And, you know, I will add that there was no animosity between the two of them. They were friends and Jason really admired Will. Um, it's just that there were these constant recyclings of the same sentiment. If you're just tuning in, I'm talking with Aaron Osman, the author of Jason Molina, Riding with the Ghost, which is available now from... Roman and Littlefield and available at finer bookstores and online retailers everywhere. I was fascinated reading your book by Jason Molina's own myth-making, even early on in the book, and his ability to tell fibs, even some that, like you're saying about the mermaid, there were certain things that he would say that even his bandmates wouldn't know. Is that the truth or some variation thereof or or just pulled completely out of thin air mm -hmm. yeah i mean that was certainly a characteristic of of jason and it it started fairly early on and i'll add that there are a lot of great storytellers in jason's family so i think it's certainly um uh, a molina a trait of the molinas um but yeah i you know he grew up in this really pastoral setting on lake erie and i think that contributed to a wild imagination you know and a keen intellectual curiosity. A lot of his boyhood really had this sort of Tom Sawyer-esque, um, you know, feel to it. And he was obsessed with finding antiquities and, and trinkets and researching history of Ohio and West Virginia, where his family lived. And, um, you know, he was really into oral, oral traditions, singing and, and storytelling traditions. And I think it all culminated um, in, in, you know, his personality and his ability to tell stories and, and to not let the truth get in the way of a good story. You've stolen my thunder a little bit with my next question about Lorraine, Ohio, and how that town shaped both Jason's outlook and his music. Yeah, I mean, 
Lorraine, I think at the time felt very insular to Jason. Um, he grew up in a trailer on Lake Erie, but, um, you know, the grounds were, were beautiful. It was, as I said, um, very pastoral. Uh, the boys learned to swim, you know, in Lake Erie's, uh, shoreline. And, um, there was just a lot of adventure, outdoor adventuring. And, you know, when they weren't outdoors, they were inside reading, you know, they had a rabid appetite for, for reading and, um, you know, studying. And, uh, I think that really informed Jason as an artist and as a thinker. Um, but, you know, I think at the time when he was growing up in Lorraine, he resented the sort of factory mentality or the rejection of anything outsider or artistic. But when he left Lorraine, he realized that it was such a strong part of him that he sort of wore this blue collar background like a badge of honor. And it's not a, a huge swath of distance from Lorraine to Oberlin, but having at least spent a decent amount of time in the latter, they are very much worlds apart. And that's where Jason, I guess, initially found the voice that would become the voice of, of all these Magnolia and Songs Ohio records. Certainly the, the, the creative and, and very liberal atmosphere at Oberlin allowed Jason to truly sort of start to become the artist that he wanted to be. It facilitated creativity. Um, people were very supportive of artists and, and musicians, both on campus and off. So I think he felt very liberated in that way. But I think he also felt a bit that he stood a bit in contrast to a lot of his peers at Oberlin because Jason was from, you know, a less privileged background. Um, his background is blue collar and a lot of students there and a lot of his friends even were upper middle class. Um, you know, Jason attended Oberlin on a scholarship. And so I think he always felt like a bit of an outsider, even though, um, you know, his art and his vision was being supported and was growing at Oberlin. My wife was at Oberlin at the same time as Jason, and she is continually baffled by the fact that she seems to have known everyone who played with him, but has no recollection of him at Oberlin and is confused about how that can be. And it's a, it's a continuing thing where she's like, he worked at the FEV? How did I not know? He was at WOBC. How did I not know this guy? And, uh, and I think she keeps waiting for that moment where, uh, where she'll realize, oh yeah, I was at that thing. So I've been, I've been sending her highlights of the book where, uh, where names of people like, you know, Peter Hess shows up and Dan McAdam and Jeff Pinal. And she's like, oh, I knew all those guys in college. How did I not know Jason? Huh. Jason was a couple years younger than those guys. So maybe, you know, they just didn't cross paths. I don't know. It's pretty strange. If you had to recommend one record, I know if people have been been listening, there are a lot of records to pull from, but actually I met a guy at the show last night who came up to me very enthusiastically, this guy, Sean, and I'm hoping he's listening to this, who stuck out his arm and was like, I, I would never have heard Jason if it wasn't for your radio show. And now I'm here with my kids and, and they were, they were really having the best time. And he just happened to come across, I think I played something from the live record from 2003 and he heard that and that was his his entry point is there a record that you would recommend to people who are listening to this conversation as an entry point into jason molina's music yeah i mean there are sort of two very distinct sounds i mean arguably two i, I think there's more than two but there's sort of songs ohio and then magnolia electric company those are his two bands and i think um a pretty accessible synthesis of the two sides of him it can be found on the album, the Magnolia Electric Company. Um, you know, that's his most critically heralded album, but I think if you're just getting acquainted with Jason, it's a very um, profound, but also very listenable, easy to di digest, excuse me, um, album. Well, why don't we hear a song from that record and we'll be back to talk a little bit more after this. Okay, thank you. While you was gone, you must have done a lot of favors. You got a whole lot of things I don't think that you could ever have paid for. While you've been busy crying about my past mistakes, I've been busy trying to make a change. And now I made the change.
with Aaron Osman on WPRB, author of Jason Molina, Riding with the Ghost. I guess I've been working my personal reflections into our conversation, and I can't think of an artist, and I doubt I'm alone in this regard, that I've found as affecting since their passing. Each and every time I'll be listening to one of Jason's records at home, my wife will always stick her head in from the other room and just say, is everything okay? And it's, it's become this thing between us, but it, it, it's, it frustrates me in a way. I had a, a really great experience seeing Magnolia Electric Company in 2006 at the church in Philadelphia, but it seems that it took his death for me to really rediscover his catalog. And I kick myself a lot of the time at the opportunities I had to see them play and didn't, and the, the records that I could have enjoyed when they came out instead of just this retrospective deep dive. And, and I imagine there are, there are others like me out there too. Yeah, I think it's certainly prompted a lot of people to revisit Jason's catalog. Um, and I think something that happens too, not just with Jason, but with a lot of independent musicians is um, people who tour a lot, tour quite frequently, sometimes are taken for granted, you know, and it's just a thing that happens. And I also think that there is such a deep catalog that for me, one of the, the distinct pleasures has been discovering songs that I didn't know and having them just really sock me in the gut in a, in a fashion that I wasn't expecting. You know, sometimes something will pop up on Pandora or, or some other shuffling service and I'm, I'm floored all over again. It seems like the, the deeper you dig into the catalog, there, there are more and more discoveries to make. And it, and it sounds like Jason had that gene that some people have where you just kind of can't stop making music. So there's, there's so much more that exists unheard that just having that compulsion to just keep writing new songs, keep pushing forward is a, a fascinating characteristic to me. Yeah. Um, one thing that Jason's wife, Darcy mentioned to me um, a couple of times was that Jason often said, if he ever got to a point where he couldn't write songs that he would die. And he wasn't saying that as sort of the product of poetic whimsy or something. He really, he really meant it. I'm also amazed by the fact that one of my all time favorites, big game is every night is a song that somehow didn't even make the original pressing of Magnolia electric company. Like that's how, now to be fair, it's an eight or nine minute song, but that's how deep that record is where it's like, ah, we'll make this a Japanese bonus track. Yeah, um, we did a Q&A um, in Chicago about a week ago with some of the, the band members who played on that album. And they have the same sentiment as you. They all loved that song. I love that song. And, and they talked about how they, they spent a lot of time trying to sequence the record in a way that they could include it. And um, Jason was very adamant about it being a single LP. And there was just no way that they could sequence it um, and, and make that song fit. So, yeah. After Jason Molina passed away, it seemed like every other week, every other month, there was another tribute record or collection of covers of his originals that popped up. Do you have any favorites that have materialized in the last couple of years? Either songs that do the originals justice or take things in a, in a direction that maybe is completely divergent from the source material? So one of my favorites um, was a cover that Mark Kozalik did of a, of a Molina tune from Let Me Go the record. It's called It's Easier Now, I believe. And it's such a gorgeous interpretation of the song. It's just incredible. Behind these eyes, a desert spirit, a sea serpent heart inside a sunken ship. I finally got it, all parts wrong. I didn't know how long it would take to do it. Behind these eyes, it's a dead grave. 
torn apart, moon in an empty room. It's easier now, I just say I got better. It's easier now, I just say I got better. It's easier when I just admit death comes now and the next minute behind these eyes. Dead gray moon, torn apart moon in an empty room. Behind these eyes, dead gray moon, torn apart room. I appreciate you taking the time to come down to WPRB and, and talk on this tour. I think by the time this airs, all of the East Coast dates will have wrapped up, but I saw that there's going to be something in Chicago on July 22nd. Yes, it's going to be another um, just great tribute and celebration of Molina. Um, the members of Songs Ohio who played on the Magnolia Electric Company album um, will be... Um, playing, you know, some of Jason's songs. We're going to have discussion. Um, I'll do some readings. And, and yeah, so similar to what we've been doing on the East Coast, just different band members. All right. I've been talking with Aaron Osman, who's the author of Jason Molina, Riding with the Ghost. Do you have a song you'd like to go out on? Oh, goodness. Before we get back to the, the program live? Let's, uh, let's do the big game is every night. All right. Right on. This is WPRB Princeton. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Thank you. It'll get so quiet when this record ends You can hear the first hour of the world You can hear the willow branches touch the way Write our names beside our darlings' hearts You can hear the willow branches touch Nothing Rosman On the shores Of the sea Shine on the distance Between me And the last thing I Let it be me helping Let it be me Honestly Let it be me working On being a better me
the field for the big game tonight. Mark Twain to Thomas Jefferson. Strike. Loop the drifter to Zimmerman. Line drive to keep the team alive. I don't want to disappoint 